the knowledge and the attributes of the holy a new in-depth study that gives more in-depth understanding and revelation about our father in heaven the one living God and creator of the universe it is a study that is actually known as the knowledge of the holy by Ave or A W I mean Tozer and uh, I would highly recommend you to buy this book yourself uh, and to get an in-depth understanding of the attributes of the almighty living God and creator of the universe himself um, so that you get a far more in-depth understanding of whom God actually is um, and uh, his attributes chapter 1 why we must think rightly about God O Lord God Almighty not the God of the philosophers and the wise but the living God of the prophets and apostles and better than all the living God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ may I express thee unblamed they that know thee not may or may call upon thee as other than thou art and so worship not thee but a creature of their own fancy therefore enlighten our minds that we may know thee as thou art so that we may perfectly love thee and worthily praise thee in the mighty name and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord Amen what comes into our minds when we think about the living God is the most important thing about us the history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion and man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God worship is pure or base as the worshipper entertains high or low thoughts of God for this reason the gravest question before the church is always the living God himself and the most uh, portentous fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do but what he in his deep heart conceives the living God to be like we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of the living God this is true not only of the individual Christian but of the company of Christians that composes the church always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of the living God just as her most significant message is what she says about him or leaves unsaid for her silence is often more eloquent than her speech she can never escape the self-disclosure of her witnessing concerning the living God were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to the question what comes into your mind when you think about the living God we might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man 
were we able to know exactly what our most influential religious leaders think of the living God today, we might be able with some pre uh, precision to foretell where the church will stand tomorrow. Without doubt, the mightiest thought the mind can entertain is the thought of the living God and the weightiest word in any language is its word for the living God. Thought and speech are God's gifts to creatures made in His image. These are intimately associated with Him and impossible apart from Him. It is highly significant that the first word was the Word. And the Word was with the living God. And the Word was the living God. We may speak because the living God spoke in Him. Word and idea are indivisible. That our idea of the living God correspond as nearly as possible to the true being of the living God is of immense importance to us. Compared with our actual thoughts about Him, our creedal statements are of little consequence. Our real idea of God may lie buried under the rubbish of conventional religious notions and may require an intelligent and vig uh, vigorous search before it is finally unearthed and exposed for what it is. Only after an ordeal of painful self-probing are we likely to discover what we actually believe about the living God. A right conception of the living God is basic not only to systematic theology but to practical Christian living as well. It is to worship what the foundation is to the temple where it is inadequate or out of plumb the whole structure must sooner or later collapse i believe there is scarcely an error in doctrine or a failure in applying christian ethics that cannot be traced finally to imperfect and ignoble thoughts about the living god it is my opinion that the Christian conception of the living God current in these middle years of the 20th century is so decadent as to be utterly beneath the dignity of the Most High Living God and actually to constitute for professed believers something amounting to a moral calamity. All the problems of heaven and earth, though they were to confront us together and at once, would be nothing compared with the overwhelming problem of the living God, that He is. What He is like and what we as moral beings must do about Him. The man who comes to a right belief about God is relieved of 10,000 temporal problems, for he sees at once that these have to do with matters which at the most cannot concern him for very long. But even if the multiple burdens of time may be lifted from him, the one mighty single burden of eternity begins to press down upon him with a weight more crushing than all the woes of the world piled one upon another. That mighty burden is his obligation to the living God. 
It includes an instant and lifelong duty to love God with every power of mind and soul, to obey Him perfectly and to worship Him acceptably. And when the man's laboring con uh, and when the man's laboring conscience tells him that he has done none of these things, but has from childhood been guilty of full revolt against the majesty in the heavens, the inner pressure of self-accusation may become too heavy to bear. The gospel can lift this destroying burden from the mind, give beauty for ashes and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. But unless the weight of the burden is felt, the gospel can mean nothing to the man. And until he sees a vision of the living God high and lifted up, there will be no woe and no burden. Low views of God destroy the gospel for all who hold them. Among the sins to which the human heart is prone, hardly any other is more hateful to God than idolatry. For idolatry is at bottom a libel on his character. The idolatrous heart assumes that the living God is other than he is in itself a monstrous sin and substitutes for the true living God one made after its own likeness. Always this God will conform to the image of the one who created it and will be base or pure, cruel or kind according to the moral state of the mind from which it emerges. A God begotten in the shadows of a fallen heart will quite naturally be no true likeness of the true living God. Thou thoughtest, said the Lord to the wicked man in the psalm, that I was altogether such as one as thyself. Surely this must be a serious affront to the Most High God before whom Cherubim and Seraphim continually do cry, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of Sabaoth. Let us beware lest we in our pride accept the erroneous notion that idolatry consists only in kneeling before visible objects of adoration and that civilized peoples are therefore free from it. The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about the living God that are unworthy of Him. It begins in the mind and may be present where no overt act of worship has taken place. When they knew God, wrote Paul, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Then followed the worship of idols fashioned after the likeness of men and birds and beasts and creeping things. But this series of degrading acts began in the mind. Wrong ideas about God are not only the fountain from which the polluted waters of idolatry flow, they are themselves idolatrous. The idolater simply imagines things about God and acts as if they were true. Perverted notions about God soon rot the religion in which they appear. The long career of Israel demonstrates this clearly enough, and the history of the Church conform of confirms it. So necessary to the Church is a lofty concept of God that when that concept in any measure declines, 
the church with her worship and her moral standards declines along with it. The first step down for any church is taken when it surrenders its high opinion of the living God. Before the Christian church goes into eclipse anywhere, there must first be a corrupting of her simple basic theology. Well, this corruption is taking place all over the world. She simply gets a wrong answer to the question. What is God like? And goes on from there. Though she may continue to cling to a sound nominal creed, her practical working creed has become false. The masses of her adherents come to believe that God is different from what he actually is. And that is heresy of the most insidious and deadly kind. The heaviest obligation lying upon the Christian Church today is to purify and elevate her concept of the living God until it is once more worthy of Him and of her. In all her prayers and labors this should have first place we do the greatest service to the next generation of Christians by pa passing on to them undimmed and undiminished that noble concept of the living God which we received from our Hebrew and Christian fathers of generations past. This will prove of greater value to them than anything that art or science can devise. And here's a little prayer from Philip Doddridge. O God of Bethel, by whose hand thy people still are fed, who through this weary pilgrimage hast all our fathers let our vows our prayers we now present before thy throne of grace god of our fathers be the god of their succeeding race amen And with this said, I have come to the end of the first chapter of this amazing uh, new in-depth study. And uh, wow, I'm longing forward to go further in this and learning more and more about the living God and his attributes. And uh, yes, it uh, it's a delight, really a delight that I can present this to you, that I'm allowed to pass this information forward to you, uh, believers as well as non-believers. Um, and um, this is what the Father is asking me to do. It's uh, the, the, the channel is with all these um, in-depth study series. You can see it as a service or ministry that I do for all my fellow brothers and sisters, believers and non-believers. So thank you so much for listening and um, God bless you. God bless you.